Welcome to this food-filled event that we at Actera like to call a holiday refresh. It is our goal this evening that you leave feeling inspired and ambitious when it comes to cooking for the upcoming holidays. And at this event, you will learn all about climate-friendly cooking and how to make sustainable dishes that are rich with diverse flavors and textures by Bay Area-based chefs that we feel are leaders in the culinary realm. This event is hosted by Actera, Action for a Healthy Planet, we are a Bay Area-based environmental nonprofit. And I am Robbie Brown, Actera's Healthy Plate, Healthy Planet program manager and your host for this evening. I'd like to start today by taking a moment to reflect and acknowledge that I'm currently residing and presenting on the ancestral land and unceded territory of the Tamian Ohlone speaking people. They are the ancestors of the Muekma Ohlone tribe. And I'd like to encourage all of you to learn more about whose land you are on and by starting that process by visiting native-land.ca. And I will also include the link to that website in the post-event email. So to kick things off, I'd like to thank our event sponsor, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, who helps support this event. Their district aims to create a healthy breathing environment for every Bay Area resident while protecting and improving public health, air quality, and the global climate. Their district supports education incentives and partnerships such as this one to help establish a leading region for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. I'd also like to give a shout out to our media sponsor as well, the Peninsula Foodist, which is your go-to newsletter for exclusive insights into what's happening in the food scene on the peninsula. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our 12 community outreach partners for their support by promoting this event. To find out more about the important work that they do, visit their expo booth and hop in or by clicking their logo on the Holiday Refresh 2021 website. Now, you may be wondering, what did he mean when he said climate-friendly cooking? Well, for this specific event, there are three core elements that we are highlighting when it comes to sustainability and cooking in the kitchen. Those three core elements are the use of induction cooktops, plant-forward eating, and preventing wasted food. Actera, uh, excuse me, Actera supports electrifying the kitchen. We use and promote the use of induction cooktops because they are more safe and sustainable when compared to gas cooktops. There are so many benefits to using induction. The heat gets transferred direct, uh, directly to your cookware. There are no open flames and better air quality because cooking with gas produces more pollutants. And with induction, you also have precise control over the cooking temperature. Here at Actera, we also like to promote eating well for the planet. So we emphasize a plant-forward diet, which focuses more on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And any animal-based products such as meat and dairy should be limited if incorporated on your plate at all. And the reason why we promote this is really for two, uh, two primary reasons. So the latest science is indicating that animal-based food groups are more carbon intensive than plant-based foods. And when it comes to health, the consumption of certain meats, especially those labeled as carcinogenic, can lead to health risks and concerns while a plant-forward diet could potentially improve one's health. And we also wanna work on preventing food from being wasted. In the United States, a large portion of food is disposed of and it decomposes in landfills, releasing a greenhouse gas that we call methane. With small changes to our daily behaviors and practices in the kitchen, we can all be part of the solution to prevent wasted food. You can always visit our website to learn tips and tricks for portion control and storage techniques for ingredients, but we also hope that you can take home some tips from the chefs this evening. And remember, if your food has to be thrown away, just make sure it goes in the compost. Now let's go over the event schedule and our featured guests for this evening. We are so excited. Our moderators will be Laren Baker and Carolyn Jung. Laren Baker is a food photographer, writer, recipe developer, and the creator of the food blog, Kitchen Confidant where she shares seasonal recipes that are inspired by her life in California, the flavors of her heritage, and her travels. She is also the author of Meat to the Side, which comes out in November, which is a vegetable-focused cookbook. Carolyn Jung is a James Beard award-winning food writer. She now freelances for publications such as the San Francisco Chronicle, Knob Hill Gazette, Eating Well Magazine, Via Magazine, and Edible Marin Wine Country. She is the author of cookbooks San Francisco Chef's Table and East Bay Cooks, and she is also the creator of the blog foodgal.com. And if you have any questions for our chefs tonight during their cooking demonstrations, 
please make sure you type them into the sessions chat box, which will appear on the right hand side of your screen. And the moderators here will do their best to address the questions to the chefs. The first two cooking demonstrations for this evening will feature Kenny Annis and Crystal Wapapa from 4.10 to 4.40 p.m. Kenny is a Bay Area restaurateur and vegan chef. Kenny currently owns Sky Cafe, which is located in South San Francisco. And Sky, uh, Sky Cafe's menu strives to celebrate the many diverse and beautiful cultures from around the world by focusing on international vegan cuisine. And today, Kenny will be preparing a vegan pumpkin risotto. Crystal Wapapa is an enrolled member of the Kickapoo Nation of Oklahoma, and she was born and raised in Oakland, California on a lonely land. Crystal has observed and participated in her cultural food ways since she was a small child. And she is now the owner of Wapapa's Kitchen, a new restaurant opening up in Oakland, as well as a catering business. She views her business as a portal to food sovereignty and the reclamation of ancestral knowledge in native and indigenous communities. Today, she will be preparing a traditional soup with squash blossoms. And I did get notice from Crystal Wapapa that she's experiencing a few technical issues. She will be here today, but she might just be a few minutes late. Afterwards, there will be a cooking demonstration from Martin Yan from 4.35 to 5.05 p.m. Martin Yan is a culinary master chef, a food consultant, a chef instructor, a prolific author with 30 best-selling titles, and a true pioneer when it comes to Chinese Asian cooking programs on television. He has a show that most of you probably know by now called The Yang Can Cook, and this show has won two consecutive James Beards Awards for Best in Food Journalism. His business, Yang Can Cook Incorporated, has grown into a full culinary force with a wide global reach, and today he will be preparing rainbow vegetables over noodle pancakes. Due to unfortunate circumstances, Fetley Work Teferi will not be able to participate during her scheduled cooking demonstration this evening. However, when you have the opportunity, please support her work by visiting her Ethiopian restaurant, Cafe Kaluchi in Oakland, or buy spices from her spice importing company that prioritizes sustainable and equitable business practices. That company is called Brundo Spice Company. Now, our last two demonstrations are for those of you with a sweet tooth. So these last two demonstrations for the evening will involve baking with Shruti Bodu and Alicia Casas from 5 to 5.30 p.m. Shruti Bodu believes her childhood experiences of traveling between India, the United States, and Singapore widened her appreciation of different flavors and led to her adoption of a cruelty-free plant-based lifestyle. And after realizing how hard it was to find flavorful plant-based cake, she began baking vegan cakes for her friends and family, which eventually led to the creation of her business, Shrew's Kitchen, where she aims to provide vegan cake cakes that balance health and taste using simple, organic, and sustainably sourced ingredients. Today, she will be making masala chai kir jars. And Alicia Casas was born and raised in the East Bay, the daughter of a first-generation mother and an immigrant father from Mexico. She is an educator and vegan baker who believes that education and veganism can uh, have the power to uplift individuals and communities. She's been an educator in San Jose for 14 years and is also the owner and head baker of Jaguar Baker, which is an all vegan bakery that specializes in Mexican pan dulce, ranging from traditional to modern flavors and forms. Today, Alicia will be making filled churro cupcakes. At 5.30, we will all return to the main stage where myself, Liren Baker, and Carolyn Jung will provide some closing remarks in an event recap. So thanks for being with us today. I cannot believe it's the holiday time coming up. How crazy is this for you? It's crazy. I've got three kids. <laughs> this time of year is always filled with dread. <laughs> I was going to actually begin by asking you, you have three daughters, correct? Yes. So yeah. what is holiday mealtime like for you with three girls around the table, um, all hungry and all wanting your attention. It's, uh, it's you know, we, we, ha we usually have it with a pretty extended family. You know, we've got different people from all over the place. So we usually spend a lot of time with a bunch of people, which is, I think, the best way to do it. And um, crazy thing about my kids is they all eat different things. So we have to come up with all kinds of different stuff for them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Like what? Can you give an example? Well, uh, 
you know, I, I make, I do, I do all the stuff from, you know, mashed potatoes, stuffings, um, risotto. I do a lot of the comfort food things. And uh, then like my youngest daughter, Sky, the one that my restaurant's named uh -huh. after, she basically only eats, you know, she's, she's vegetarian, almost vegan. Um, she likes chocolate. So she's, that's, I think she's gets a hold of some of those sometimes, but, um, <laughs> but uh, she, uh, she likes like rice and, you know, the most plain things you could imagine, it's, uh, just vegetables uncooked. So I'm preparing things for her. And then for my other kids, they have, they have different tastes. One of them likes curries. One of them doesn't. So wow. I, so I try to, I try to do something to make everybody happy, but so you're busy for days doing this, obviously. Oh, yeah. And I, come from, <laughs> you know, we do the, I always do this big thing uh, around the holidays for the re at the restaurant where I cook for a bunch of people. And I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. So today you're doing pumpkin risotto. Yes. And tell us what the inspiration was for this particular dish. Well, when I was growing up, I grew up. Uh, in a household in Iowa, my dad was a minister. My mom was, you know, we were just really involved in the church and things. And my, my, I had two brothers from Vietnam and we had, we'd always have people coming over from all over the place. And, um, so there was no like one set of things that we would eat at the holidays. It'd be sort of a mishmash. We'd also always do like, um, you know, potlucks, people would bring different things. And I was always kind of drawn to the more casserole-y things. I just love them. I think they make you feel like you're, yeah, like it's your grandmother's making it for you or your mom or something like that, or your dad. Um, and uh, so as I've been, and I started, when I became vegetarian back in late 80s. And so I sort of had to fend for myself. There wasn't a lot of vegetarian options, especially in Waterloo, Iowa and, and uh, places like that. So... I um, have been experimenting with lots of things over the years and risotto has always been one of my favorite. And then this year I was thinking, you know, I want to make a, a pumpkin risotto and put it in the pumpkin shell, you know, and serve it like that. And so um, I did it one day and it was really good. And so now I'm going to do it this year. Well, gonna, gonna why, don't, why don't you show everyone how to do this incredible dish? Okay, sounds great. So uh, I'm going to turn this thing up higher than I normally would. No, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, that's a little high. Go. Is that because you're doing, you're using induction or? Yeah, I'm using the induction and I'm going to try to make it a little bit hotter so I can cook a little bit faster so I can fit it in our time frame. Because I timed it, it takes me about a half an hour from start, start to finish, maybe a little bit longer. So I'm going to try to get it all good and done. So I start with uh, some, some olive oil. And butter. This is Miyoko's butter right here. Mm -hmm. and start with that. Put that in there. Let that heat up. And then I, I take some shallots. You can also use just white onion. I don't have a preference really. I, I kind of, it just depends on what I have at hand. Oops. So, you know, traditional, very traditional Italian chefs will say that Risotto has to be cooked to order. Do you agree with that or not? I mean, you know, somewhat. I don't. I don't think you want it to sit around for a long time. But I mean, I make when I make these things, they kind of sit in the refrigerator and then I reheat them and they taste pretty good. But yeah, when you do it, like, um, I, I would kind of sort of agree with that. It's uh, it's pretty it's pretty uh, tasty to do it that way. Let me show you something while this is starting to heat up here. So I. Um, I went, for timing issues, I, uh, I pre-cooked um, some pumpkin, and this is, I, I pulled out part of it um, and cooked that all in this with my tagine lid on it, and uh, so I just did it like this. Oh, that's very cool presentation. And it tastes... It, it's just a wonderful way to cook a pumpkin if you're ever interested in how to do it. And I just did a little water bath in it with a little butter and set it in here. It's just absorbing some of the flavor right now from the butter. And uh, Are you using a particular type of pumpkin? 
Because I know I, some are better for eating and some are better for decorating for Halloween. I, I use the red curry this time, but I, 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 use, I use any kind of pumpkin. Even I made one the other day out of uh, just a standard orange pumpkin, the smaller one, and it was, turned out great. Because um, I think it's a lot has to do with the flavoring that you're putting in it. So I'm just going to get that going. Lise, could you grab me inside that bag over there? I have some, um, I have some garlic. Could you serve this in tiny little individual pumpkins too? Yeah, you can. That's a great. That's a great uh, way to do it. Actually, um, I'm, the way I'm making it right now is for like a couple people. You know. Um, oh no! Nope. Oh, my garlic has seemed to have escaped my. Uh, um, well, yes, we have some garlic in the cabinet. That's right. I got kind of thrown off because I was trying to figure out that electronic stuff. But uh, <laughs> let's do that. So I cook that down for a while until it starts to get, you know, where you can see through it, translucent. And then. Yeah, there, there, you know what? There's nothing that's traditional about how I do anything. So if anybody <laughs> out, he is doing this not the way I would do it, that's because I just kind of wing it, you know. Um, hey, some of the best things start out that way, right? <laughs> I, I totally agree. That's my that's my favorite. And it's like, you know what? There's a lot of people that are that are, you know, it can be scary to cook. And when you're cooking for people and stuff, you you feel like, oh man. Is anybody gonna like what I'm, what I do, and and all that? And uh, I think it's really important to uh, not think that way and uh, cook to your taste buds, and you know, because when you're sharing your what you like with people, you know, they get a, it's, they get a sense of who you are, and um, you know, you're breaking bread with people. And you want, you want when you're eating their food, you want them to share you what, what they love, and so. Um, that's how I, I think people to... get extra stressed out during the holidays too because they feel like every absolute little thing has to be perfect or else the holiday's a disaster. What do you say to them? I say just relax. It's family, <laughs> family. It's like, you know, who cares? Just do your best and enjoy it. Enjoy the time with people and, um, you know, I, it's happened. I've, I've, I've been that guy that ended up at the, um, you know, the Chinese restaurant on mm -hmm. Christmas Day because either I messed something up or didn't have time to cook or something, and Chinese food's great. <laughs> and is that our like, Oreo rice that you're using? Yeah. And it goes in raw into the pan and you're kind of so, toasting it? Yeah, so you just kind of, you're just cooking it in with the, with the oil and the butter and um, you just, you just, it's parboiling, you know, just kind of cooking it down to where it's becoming translucent again. And then you don't want it to brown, though. You want to keep it moving. That's the thing about um, risotto. The main thing is to keep it, keep it moving. It's not a dish you can just stick on the stovetop and then go have a drink in the other room with your friends. You have no. to watch it all the time. Or you, have, or you have to have someone like I have, a, I have my pal over here and <laughs> stir for me. Once I, once I, not quite yet, once I get the wine going. Actually, you can open up this wine for me and get that thing ready to go. Um, we actually have a question from the audience. Okay. From Mackenzie, who asks, is your assistant wearing a jacket that says vegan? If yes, so, she yes. thinks it's super cool. Yes, oh, there you go. <laughs> Lisa is super cool. I, can, I will attest to that. She's awesome. She's, She's a very good cook too. She, she gave me a couple of weeks ago, she came in with a huge bucket of, um, of prickly pears. Uh-huh. And um, what are the other things? The Nepales. The, the Nepales. And told me to cook something with it. She had already had, cooked me a really good dinner with it so I had a lot of fun with that okay and then once you get to about there before you put, I think my recipe when I was putting it together I said put about a 
five tablespoons or a, a quarter cup or, or something of wine in there. I like just a little bit. What kind of wine are you using? I'm using this one right here. It's a Sauvignon Blanc by Bonterra. It's a vegan wine. Um, it's not very expensive, but it tastes good. Um, Should it be a Sauvignon Blanc, Blanc or can it be a Chardonnay? It, it can be anything. Green? I mean, you know what, to be honest with you, it, you know, it wants to be on the drier end. Uh -huh. But I, uh, I made, I made uh, risotto not long ago with a Pinot Grigio and it still came out tasting really yummy. I wanted to ask you a seasonal question because I think we all sort of go googly eyed during the summer at farmers markets because of all the colors and all the wonderful stone fruit in season. And in winter, things get a little more drab looking and there aren't so many choices. What are, what are your favorite sort of winter time produce picks? You know what? Yesterday I made a purple potato soup. Oh. And it was beautiful. It tastes delicious. Um, yeah, I love the I love the the squashes. Um, you know, there's there's quite a few like yummy things, but you know, definitely more of the potatoes, mm -hmm. the pumpkins, um, that kind of thing. Things that can last for a long time squash so now i'm using this uh i just picked up this sometimes i make a broth um today i did not i but i got this at rainbow i think it's a good brand and that's just and vegetable that's, stock that's that's just a vegetable stock yep so let's say you're planning Thanksgiving dinner for, let's say, five o'clock, how soon would you start making this risotto? The risotto I would make right before. That'd probably be one of the last things I would make. Um, you know, I would probably have it done a half an hour before dinner starts so, and just have it warm in, a, in an oven, um, you know, put it like a hundred 50 degrees or something, have it sitting there for a half an hour. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know what? Thanksgiving, I always find not everything's piping hot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough space. You know, I don't have a, at home, I don't have like a. Not enough you know, hands, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, things have to, you know, then you kind of just eat it all day long anyway. So here I'm putting a pumpkin in now. Sometimes people run their. I've seen other recipes for the, the um, pumpkin risotto and people um, actually, they, uh, they take it through a blender. Oh, um, to puree it, yeah. To puree it and mix uh -huh. it in there. This one may actually become that because I cooked it, I cooked it in the tajin lid thing with the other pumpkin and it cooks really fast. So, uh, but usually I like it even to be a little bit um, chunky just because it tastes really good. Can you tell people a little bit about the pan that you're using? Is it non-stick? Yeah, it's a non-stick. I mean, to be honest, this was because the parameters of this, this function is to use one of these induction mm -hmm. um, uh, cookers. This one is the New Wave. Um, and it's this thing is an awesome thing. So only this gets hot. See my fingers down there? Uh-huh. Like this isn't hot. I think it's just incredible. It just goes right into the pan and um, cooks really, really good and fast. It's hot like almost instantly, you're boiling water and I'm not gonna get one of these suckers. <laughs> so I notice when you're pouring in the stock, you're just pouring in room temperature. You're not heating the stock. No, I, I mean, no, I, 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 with this thing, I haven't found that I need to, to uh, normally I would kind of have it, mm -hmm. if I would have a little bit more time, I probably would have had it on another cooktop, hot, and been spooning it in that way. But this thing, this thing, um, see, I, I've cooked it on here a couple of times now, and it seems to do the trick, just pouring it directly from there. But yes, if, you, if you're cooking this at home, it's best to put it, um, to have it on the oven, have one pot of your stock, and be pouring it in there. 
So I think that the, the tricky part with risotto for a lot of folks, including myself, is to know when it's done and what kind of texture. Do you want it really thick? Do you want it a little loose? What do you prefer? I like it to hold some form. Mm -hmm. So so it kind of, it's shapeable, you know? So it's, it's not just slopping into your bowl, uh -huh. but you can have a little bit of a standing there. Um, and should it be al dente or I, more cooked yeah, through? Uh, um, parmesan. Um, I uh, I don't. I, I have. I like it slightly al dente. That's how I like it. Yeah. Just adding some some uh, parmesan. This is uh, fresh vegan parmesan. Follow, this is follow your. Wait, this is bio life, which is awesome. It's really good. And so this dish could be the centerpiece, the entree, but it could also be a side dish, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of think of pumpkin risotto. Well, either way, I mean, I my daughter loves this. My, um, my middle daughter, mm -hmm. she loves it. So for her, this would probably be an entree for, you know, for the holidays. Me too, right? I mean, so do your daughters people. like to help you cook? I think one of them does. Actually, my little, my littlest one, Sky, she likes to, um, and my, and my middle daughter, Kira, my oldest daughter, not so much. She's kind of into her singing and oh, doing you know, her own thing. <laughs> okay, and to, to to get to your point about like knowing when it's done. Uh huh. I, I'm in a foreign kitchen here. Where's the spoons? Yeah, spoons. Little spoons. Right here. Okay, well, the only way to really know is to, to I know it's not quite ready, but I can see how mm -hmm. much more I'm going to. Yeah. These about. It's still a lot. So you've had quite the past year and a half half as we all have. And I know that you closed your daily city restaurant and then mm -hmm. that happened in the fall of 2020. And yep. then you opened Sky Cafe in March, 2021. What were those months like for you? Um, there was a lot of transitioning. Um, I had a partner at, at the Knicks on Grand and we, um, decided to get rid of that, and then I started. Um, I started Sky Cafe, and then it's sort of been, you know, it's it's been an interesting way to start a business, you know, in the middle of the pandemic and and, and that. But um, it's been it's also been very rewarding. I've I've had such beautiful people in my life, and and um, you know, patrons and and friends alike, and. Just uh, the support and all that has been really a miracle. It's, it's, I feel very blessed. And For people who haven't visited Sky Cafe yet, can you tell people a little bit about your restaurant? What do you do there? What kinds of dishes do you make? Specialties? Sure. So um, when I was um, when I was kind of going through this transition, didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I built this wood burning oven in my backyard and then started. Um, cooking stuff from, from different places around the world. And I started this project where I was cooking one dish from every country and was trying to, was doing this veganize the world project. And then um, I started thinking, well, that's what I'd like to do for the restaurant. And um, so I started thinking about my favorite dishes from places either I've been or just recipes I stumbled upon or, um, you know, things I've eaten in places. And, um, and that's really how that was the inspiration. So the idea is we're all one family under the, under the sky. And, um, you know, it's kind of a reaction to there was so much, I felt like in the midst of all this pandemic stuff, there was so much anger and distrust and, and, um, 
all this stuff, I thought, you know, I want to make a place where everybody's welcome. Everybody can break bread. There's something for everybody there. And uh, so that's what I try to do. And we have, um, we have music there. Um, again, world music, people from different walks of life. And, um, you know, that's, that's the, kind of the goal is to make it. A, Are you doing um, takeout as well? Yeah, we do takeout. And so some of the dishes are, like we do, we do a kebab from uh, North Africa. Um, we do, um, we do satay from Malaysia. We do burritos, tacos. We do chimichurri from Argentina. Um, we do a, we do a, an omelet from, um, it's a fried kimchi omelet from Korea. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And then, and then that will, that will also be changing up and we'll be, um, we'll be doing, um, you know, kind of seasonal, seasonally we'll be changing our, a lot of our things up so that we can rotate in new countries and, and that kind of so you're also a musician and an artist. What kind of musician and what kind of artist? Terrible artist, <laughs> but I love it. And, uh, not a great musician, but I I, uh, I love to play music. And um, I play. Do you play an instrument? Yeah. So I've been playing Indian classical music for um, for several years. I played I play guitar and bass and some piano. But I play this instrument called Sarod, and that's kind of been my main instrument. And I have an electric version, so I've kind of been, I think that's been sort of my focus over the last uh, few years anyways. But um, yeah, I've been playing that instrument for like 30 years now. It's unbelievable. So is um, cooking, do you think cooking is an art or a skill? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's an art. It's like anything else. It's just like, I mean, obviously there's skill. Like, that you need, you need to learn some skills to do it but um it's uh to me it's just like it's the same thing as playing music or painting a picture it's um uh, it's all just kind of expressing yourself through a medium and uh that's why that's why it's so awesome you know it's awesome to share with other people and have them share with you because uh you know it really gives you gives people a a real close glimpse into your into your world and that. So Chef, we're coming up on you're having five minutes left. So I'm thinking maybe we should start plating. Yeah. Okay. Just to show people what it looks like. I think it's just about done too. Any other questions out there for Chef Kenny? about this dish or anything else just use your chat function and we will ask away i've got um the microgreens over there yes. i'm gonna chop some chops no it's okay oh no microgreens they're in they're in one of those bags over there no, it was in a uh, Whole Foods bag. <laughs> or not Whole Foods, uh, Rainbow. Rainbow. So here they are. So I just usually do a little um, microgreen or some kind of a, uh, if I can get the garden thing open. Please, can you Start. use your non-shaking hands? <laughs> I, mean, I always get a little nervous when I'm in front of people, you know. Hey, you're among friends. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's that's the whole thing I just preach to people about. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you're telling people more, not to be nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's much more like technology for me. Is the the so I would do some sort of you know something so like you, that. If people didn't have microgreens. What else? Could oh you no, you could use any kind of like either green onions, chives. You could just shine it and just you know something like that. You can put, and then, ta-da. That's beautiful. So I'll put that over here so people can use. And um, it's really good. And then, you know, when you eat it, you eat it, you actually eat the bowl. Oh my God, it's so good. Kind of like a chowder bowl with bread. Yeah, no, it's, ex it's exactly like that. It's like That's you're- uh, all vegetarian. Yep. 
So is this going to be on your Thanksgiving table? Yes. Yes, it will be. This year it will be. Yep. And what what made you decide to become a chef? Were you someone uh, who always cooked when you were a little kid? Yeah, I always cooked when I was a kid. Um, you know, and then when once I became vegetarian and then later vegan, I mean, I really did it out of necessity. I cooked, but I, I always loved it. I always loved having people over and cooking for them. And about 10 years ago, I bought my... I bought into my first restaurant by, I'm a construction, you know, I do carpentry. So I built this place in Oakland and, um, but I wasn't the cook there, but I always wanted to, to be, have more of that role. And then when me and Raina bought our restaurant, then I did a lot more of that. Um, although she was the chef at those restaurants, but this time I decided, Hey, you know what? I'm going to share with the world what I got. So that's, that's what, this is my first venture into doing it on, on my own. And well, I'm not on my own. I actually have to give a shout out to this guy, to the people that are at my, my restaurant. Angel is an excellent chef. He works with me. We work side and side, side by side there. He actually, he actually works a lot more there than I do. So I don't want to steal any of his thunder. He's an amazing person. I love him. And um, I just have great people around me over there. But anyways, that's, that's why I started. I love cooking. I love, um, breaking bread with people and, you know, it's like having a nice family, you know, like house party every day if it's done. Right. <laughs> so we have a question from Ariane who says, what do you cook in place of turkey for Thanksgiving? Well, <clears throat> I actually make like vegan um, turkey. Uh, I do um, a seitan that I make out of um, flour and water. That's one of them. I use a couple of different things. Um, I do this flour and water wash with, um, that's, I'll be serving that this year. And also I use a couple other, um, store-bought things that then I do some different work on and, and, uh, change into, um, an alternative chicken or alternative. So do you actually try and shape it like a bird or? No, I, I used, I used to, when I first started doing it, I think now I'm, I've gotten to the point where. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> now I want to uh, just give people really tasty food and, um, you know, leave the birds alone. I love the birds. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's all the time we have for now. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Chef Kenny, for doing this. And happy Ooh. Thanksgiving and happy holidays. You too. Have a great day. Hello everyone, my name is Chef Crystal walker -Palm. I'm Keith and Queen Sacrifox. I am an indigenous chef from Oakland, California. I'm also the owner of walker Cross Kitchen's new restaurant here in the Fruitvale area. I am doing a demonstration today of a pearl hominy squash soup. And what I'm gonna do is actually gonna come together and I'm just gonna introduce you to each ingredient that I'm gonna make, okay? First of all, we have our butternut squash. This is very easy to find. You can go to your farmer's market or you can go to your whole food store wherever you want to go and get some butternut squash and just ice it up. And then, of course, for our main flavor of the soup is actually celery. And we have beautiful carrots. And then I actually like to have just, it's not really spicy. It adds a little flavor to it. What we have right here is just Anaheim pepper. And then we have culinary sage. And then the main ingredient, what we're going to add right here, is actually a pearl hominy. If, I wish you would get a little closer here. A pearl hominy. People are asking yourself right now, what's a pearl hominy? A pearl hominy is actually a hominy that's kind of cracked. Um, it is pretty much like the broken piece of a hominy, of a full hominy, but then it's very easy to get um, online. You can purchase it on Amazon. You can purchase it in the stores. Um, if, if not, you're more than welcome to go ahead and um, purchase it um, in a can. You can get the canned hominy. But where I'm going to start at right here is just kind of do a little introduction of how I got involved of making this soup. Well, one, my grandmother. My grandmother always loved cooking traditional hominy. And, and when it comes to uh, the pearl hominy, it's really 
um, based on how you're going to cook it. Like, for instance, here at the restaurant, we cook it in duck fat or we cook it in bison fat. But um, with this one, we're going to make a real nice, good vegan soup with this. And so what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to add just a little bit of the um, olive oil to the pan. Just a little sprinkle. Um, if you had to go measurement wise, we'll say a tablespoon. And then I'm going to continue to dice up my onions. And what I have right here is actually a quarter cup. So a quarter cup of onions. So these are just the yellow onions. You can use white onions or red onions, but I like using the yellow onions just because of the traditional base of it and just of the flavor. Um, sometimes you can use sweet onions are good, but I just like using just the regular yellow onions. So I'm adding this to the, the frying pan right here. And the reason why I'm gonna brown it along with our celery and along with our carrots is we're gonna go for that flavor and the aroma. You're gonna smell it in the room, it smells really good. And so I have two whole carrots if you're at home, you're more than welcome to use three, but I suggest two. Um, if we had to go by cup wise, a cup of diced carrots, okay? So I'm just gonna simple dice them as we would do any carrots, just like a little circle all around like there. And then I'm gonna add it to the real nice smelly aroma of the onions. So we're gonna add two of these into there. You don't have to dice it up too thick or too thin. Um, you just want it where it's going to cook and all the flavors can actually speak to each other. And, and then what I'm going to reach over here at the same time, I'm going to stir it. Stir is a must. And then um, I'm going to come over here with our celery. So I started off with a quarter cup of diced white onions, a cup of carrots, now we're gonna go for a half a cup of celery. So as we're coming together with this, I'm just gonna chop them up just a little bit. They don't have to be big or small. What we're really going for is these flavors. So we're gonna let all these flavors come together and speak to each other all at the same time. And then what I did ahead of time is actually, I started um, a butternut squash. Sometimes at the stores you can get them already pre-diced or you can just go ahead and purchase the butternut squash. With the butternut squash, I would totally uh, <clears throat> bake if you want it easier to cut. But if not, you're more than welcome to cut it when it's really nice and hard and how you have to place it. But what I did right here is actually a full cup of diced butternut squash. I'm gonna throw it all in here in the pan, in this frying pan. So what we got going on here, we actually have our white onions, our carrots, our celery, and our butternut squash. And I don't know if you can hear it, but it's sizzling really good. And so I'm just gonna toss them together until we get a, get a really good brown color. And that's from the olive oil. And then it smells really good in here actually. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is actually put some salt on it, okay? Hang on really quick. I'm going to sprinkle, we'll say, a good tablespoon of salt, okay, on it. And you might say, oh, wow, tablespoon. But actually, the salt, and when it hits the vegetables, it actually comes together. It's almost like they're like a marriage. <laughs> they're all, they're coming together. I don't know if I should say marriage, but, you know, they, just love, they love to speak to each other and talk to each other. And at the same time, as I'm um, stirring this and then I'm having it all nice and comfortably um, soft together. What I'm going to do is let this brown just a little few minutes more and then I'm going to add the Anaheim peppers, which sometimes a lot of natives, we make a lot of hatch chili, but the closest we can find since I reside here in California is the Anaheim. I'm going to throw that also in there. So we have all these beautiful flavors coming together. And this is what our hominy soup is going to be flavored of, of our butternut squash, of our carrots, of our onions, and our salad. And as this is coming together and browning, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the hominy. 
So with my grandmother, she always had harmony all the time. It depends what kind of harmony um, that everybody here are familiar with. So most of the people here are probably familiar with the can harmony, but this is the old time traditional harmony right here. It's a craft harmony. So if you had to look it up online, just put pearl harmony and harmony will come up. And you would need to pre soak this maybe an hour before, before we can start to boil into the soup. So what I did an hour before I pre soaked it and it puffs up just perfect almost like a real pretty popcorn, I guess you can say it. And then from there, as I'm continue stirring my veggies and it's all becoming nice and brown, smelling of the aroma in here, we're gonna add four cups of water and we're gonna have this come to a boil. As we're adding our four cups of water, it's gonna come to a really nice, good, <clears throat> fast, hard boil. And when it's on a high boil, this is where you want to put, set it on low. Okay. So we're going to set this one on low. Um, if we had to go degrees wise, I'm going to say 300. And we're just going to let this cook for around 30 minutes until all the veggies are all nice softened up. So what I add in here, I added butternut squash. I added celery, onions, and carrots and an Anaheim pepper. Um, if you're at home, you don't have to put the pepper in there, but it just adds a little bit more flavor. And at the same time, I have around three stems of culinary sage. We're just going to go ahead and put three leaves in there, okay? So here goes one leaf, two, three. And we want all these flavors to come to a high boil all at the same time. And when it does, remember I said to put it on low. And then as we're building all this flavor up from all these vegetables, and then we're gonna go ahead and continue to add a hominy, okay? So as all the flavors are coming to a nice good boil, I'm gonna add a cup of hominy. And it's really, really delicious. And this is something that my grandmother used to make um, for us all the time. You can either put it in a crock pot. That's great. Um, you don't always constantly have to watch it, but this dish cooks in 30 minutes. Um, if you buy the pre can hominy, but if you don't, you're looking at an hour's time altogether. But believe me, it's well worth it. And so as our soup is coming to a really nice good boil, and the aroma in here smells really good. I'm just going to talk about a little bit more about my grandmother. I always talk about her all the time because this is one thing that we love to do is harvest corn. Corn harvest time is actually in late August to first part of September. And so we would have these corns harvest and actually we would save these corns just for like the holidays, for instance. You have Thanksgiving coming up and then you have Christmas coming up. Um, these are the best dishes to make during these holiday seasons. So if you had to come to my home, definitely you would have hominy. <laughs> and so it's called a traditional hominy stew. Only reason why is because it is how it's slow roasted and how it's harvested. But also everyone at home normally makes it with some type of protein. But today I'm making it vegan. I love how wholesome and clean it is all at the same time, how we have the natural, the culinary sage, and then we also have the salt, we have the squash, we have the carrots and the Anaheim pepper and the white onions. All of that comes together to me personally with the hominy, it's like a beautiful marriage. <laughs> and as this is coming to a boil, I actually have a pot right here that is finished and it smells so, so good. And you can, I wish you guys could see all these beautiful colors and I would love for you guys to give me a wonderful feedback um, on this dish. But if you want to celebrate during the holidays, this is one dish that you could celebrate with. It's a traditional hominy vegan stew. And so as I'm putting all these beautiful vegetables all together. 
And at the same time, I'm going to have some hominy in here. Um, this is something that is actually with the culinary sage, something about it. So you'll see the leaves in it. So make sure after everything is boiled, um, you're more than welcome just to kind of put them out. But this dish is really beautiful and vibrant, and it doesn't really take that long. Um, as long as you have the right veggie stocks, you can do any kind of hominy stew, even if you want to bathe laurel leaf at the same time. It all kind of depends if you want thyme, any kind of flavor that can go into this. And you'll have your traditional hominy stew. And then as I top it off with the squash blossoms, people ask me, where do you get the squash blossoms? Actually, if you're here in the Bay Area, you're familiar with a lot of farmer's markets. They're very easy and accessible to get to or even at your farmer's market grocery store. And once you get those, I, you can dehydrate them in the oven on 100 or either you can go ahead and just lay them out, place them out with the fan and have the fan hit it like pretty much all day, but that'd be a lot of electricity. I would advise to put it into a little oven or dehydrator if you have time. And they come really beautiful as you as we place them right on top. And it's just like a really nice, good indigenous touch, especially with the squash blossoms. And I want to inter introduce you to our traditional hominy stew vegan style. Thank you. Love to have your feedback. Hi again, my name is Liren Baker. I am the creator of the site Kitchen Confidant and author of Meat to the Side. I am so pleased to introduce Chef Martin Yan as a culinary master chef, food consultant, chef instructor, prolific author, and a true pioneer in Chinese and Asian cooking programs on television. Chef Martin Yan has been teaching the world to cook with his James Beard award-winning show, Yan King Cook, as well as through his gourmet tours, his flagship restaurant, MY China, and as a motivational speaker. I am especially pleased to welcome my childhood hero. Welcome, Chef. Welcome, and I'm honored to be here to share the stage with all the luminary, all the wonderful culinary professionals. Oh my God. I'm glad to be here. Well, I used to watch your show every day after school, so I am so excited to finally chat with I, you. I would really like to know very quickly, when did you first show an interest in Cooking Chef? Well, I was, uh, I was born into a restaurant family. My father had a had a restaurant. My mother has a grocery store in Guangzhou, China. When I was before even I was born, and then later on, I kind of when I was growing up, I actually hang around the restaurant and the grocery store. So I was pretty much interested and in knowing a lot of the different seasoning and different ingredients, things that are even a, a lot of adult probably never seen because I hang around the uh, the store and the restaurant. And then I have to ask, just because you have the most amazing knife skills, when did you first pick up a knife? <laughs> well, I left I left uh, China when I was pretty young, uh, around in the tender age of 13, 14. And then I went to Hong Kong and I actually lived. And I went to high school and I actually lived in a, uh, my distant uncle's restaurant. So I always, always tried to use the, the knife to help them out and work and, and as a backup, a chef, uh, a sous chef and a uh, uh, kitchen assistant and, and, and learn how to bone the chicken, cut up all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's just a skill, just like any Japanese sushi chef, any tennis player. Once you pick up a knife enough time and long enough, then you become proficient. <laughs> well, hopefully one day I'll get as proficient as you. Well, chef, can you tell us a little bit more about the dish that you're preparing today? Well, you know, I'm honored to, uh, to be uh, sharing with everybody how wonderful it is to have a plant-based diet as well as cooking with induction burner. The reason why we do it is because a lot of people don't realize in Asia, in Japan, in Korea, India, and many parts of China and Taiwan, many Asian cuisine, actually plant-based diet are very, very much a common practice. In fact, in my daily diet, I cook a lot of vegetable. So even though I eat other things, but mainly, my diet is a plant-based diet. So I think the reason why I've been 
eating that is because, you know, in our body, first of all, we don't need that much meat protein. We need a lot of protein, but it can be plant protein, okay? Plant-based products available everywhere is, and also when you have plant-based product and use a lot of ingredient, basically you lower the carbon footprint and the environmental friendly and also less pollution, okay? And now people chop up all the, all the forests and this and that to plant other things and to raise cattle. Now you can eliminate the problem of deforestation. And also we eat healthier. And that's the reason why today I'm gonna show you how to do something, okay? This is noodle. This is a plant-based noodle. This is basically made with wheat, flour and water, right? Very, very, this is the actual noodle. You can buy them fresh or frozen or dry. And I cook them, I cook them up and let it fluff it. And then I'll pan fry this. I will pan fry this right here. And I pan fry this and I use this wonderful, wonderful induction burner. Now, I pan fry this, look at that. From here, you can tell this, from these boiled noodle, okay? Plant-based, made with Sometimes soba noodle, you can use soba noodle, you can use a uh, uh, wheat flour noodle. And I pan fry this into the frying pan right here, okay? Until the golden brown, night this on both sides. Golden brown on both sides like this, okay? Then I set it aside, okay? I set this aside, put it right here. And then I'm gonna show everybody the ingredient that I use. This is very, very good ingredient, let me tell you. Here, let me go through quickly, go through this. The main ingredient of this is basically, I'm going to set this up a little bit. Okay, good. Chef, a really quick question from the audience. Yes. What kind of yes. oil did you use to pan fry the noodles? I use uh, vegetable oil. In fact, I use, this is a very healthy oil, the camellia tea seed oil. It's also plant-based, tea seed oil. You can use olive oil, you can oh. use any of these. This is very, very healthy, and there's a lot of antioxidant. That's the reason why. You gotta cook healthy, you gotta eat healthy, okay? We use oil pan fried it just enough. Heat up your frying pan. Best to use a non-stick frying pan and pan fried on both sides. And once when, once I do that, I will actually, let me show you quickly. Once I do that, I can actually slide this over here. This is pan fried. This is noodle pan fried. Look at that. I basically, Toss this noodle and press it and into from a little noodle pancake into a noodle bowl like this, an amount of noodle. And I'll set aside and I'm gonna use this and put my stir fried vegetable right on top. So this is basically a one dish meal. Okay. So the next thing we'll show you and some you of the probably use, hmm? you could probably use leftover noodles, right? If you have oh, any leftovers from definitely. another dish. This is the noodle leftover, okay, from last time. So I basically boil it up, boil it, then we have boiled noodle. And once you do that, you can put this in noodle soup, never waste anything. In Asia, never waste anything because this food is precious in Asia. So that's why we never waste anything. So we can use this to do fry noodle, noodle soup with all kinds of stuff. Now, the ingredient we use, vegetarian. I have shiitake mushroom, okay? If you have, you can also get dry mushroom, and let it soak. Dry mushroom, dry shiitake mushroom, and then celery. Celery is really, really healthy. It's really good and give that wonderful uh, uh, aroma and taste and texture. And of course, you, if you happen to have carrot, this is a little half a piece of carrot. I use half a piece of carrot. And then this is leftover cabbage I have. This is the head cabbage and done. Now, this is interesting. There are two things that are interesting that I put it in. This is cloud ear or cold wood ear. Look at that. You can buy them fresh or you can buy them dry. You can soak them and then you can basically slide them. Ah, now this is important. You go to the Asian store or sometimes regular store. You can buy some pressed bean curd. This is pressed bean curd. It looks like this. Inside, when you cut it open, it looks like this, okay? This is pressed bean curd. When you use the pressed bean curd, you can buy this marinated pressed bean curd in Asian store. Once you get it, you can put it in the fridge or you can actually keep it in the freezer. 
When you use this, this is how you do it. I slice this into thin slices like this. Look at that. I slice it one. I cut it from the top. I cut one one slice and then I cut another slice. Knife have to be sharp and I cut another slice. Look at that. And I cut another slice and then another slice. Okay, look at that. And then I have all of these slices and I line them all up like this. Okay, I line them all up like this. And then I use my knife. Go. What stupid questions can we use rice noodles instead of the wheat? Uh, you can, uh, no, that's different. Uh, rice noodle, you use it for soup, for thing, um, uh, uh, the different texture. You can use rice noodle because particularly if you have gluten uh, allergy, you use rice noodle, okay? Rice noodle is available in a lot of places. I slice it and then I also slice some of these wood ear or cloud ear. I put and it all together. And then the question for that, the cow, that is a mushroom, right? Not a seaweed. Yeah, this is actually a mushroom. Okay. It, in Chinese it's called cloud ear because it looks like an elephant ear. Look at that, it <laughs> looks like an ear. That's the reason why they call it. It's actually black mushroom. It's a fungus. The fungus is very good. There are all kinds of mushroom. We should eat more mushroom. The Chinese restaurant use a lot of different variety of mushroom. And then we will put it over here. And then shiitake mushroom. This is also mushroom. I shredded it. So this is how I do it. I slice it at this angle. I slice it here and cut it in half. It looks like this, you see? Then I go. You see, slice it up, and then this is fresh shiitake mushroom. If you happen to have dry shiitake mushroom, you soak them. You soak, soak them up until they soften. You stack them all up, you stack them all up, and then you slice it like this. Look at how fast you can do it. All do done. You, do you prefer the flavor of dried or fresh shiitake? Oh, definitely, definitely. I favor uh, definitely like that. And then in the meantime, I'm going to show you quickly how to do this dish and it's very very simple okay i cut this up i cut all of these up already and then i'm going to stir fry this basically i use a time of oil now you notice that i use an induction burner right here why because it's safer it's efficient as soon as you put it on it is heavy and then if you have a bigger pot it heats up the whole pot if you have a smaller pot only heat up the bottom so it's very very um, is uh, transferred directly. The heat transferred directly to your cookware. Waste nothing. Very, very efficient. Environmentally sound. That's the reason why. There's also no open frame. That is very, very safe. And then also, because of that, better air quality. Okay? Precise control. That's the reason why. Control the temperature. Now I heat this up and I put this over here. Look at that. Beautiful. And then I stir fry this. And if you want to have flavor, when you do vegetarian, you gotta have flavor. Garlic, I press the garlic, okay? I have little press of garlic here, and I crush it, and I go chop it up. And then the same thing with ginger. I have a piece of ginger here. I go, <laughs> one piece of ginger, another piece of ginger. <laughs> Once, all done like this, very simple. And I put this over here, and then I will put all these ingredients over here. Carrot takes longer. Cabbage takes longer to cook. And then mushroom, okay? And then shredded, wonderful, crusting curd. Cloud ear, put it in. Celery, put it in. And all you have to do is stir fry this. And I'll show you how efficient this is. The good thing about induction burners, as, as long as you lift it up, it is connected. If you put it back, it immediately heats up. That's the reason why. I put a tiny bit of soy sauce. Look at that. Soy sauce is also plant based. Soy sauce. A tiny bit of sesame seed oil, also plant based. That's the key. Oh, look at that. We have a we quick question from Diana asking if we have to have special pots and pans with induction. Oh, yeah, you have to have a pan, have a bottom. Let me show you the bottom, the pan at the bottom. It has to have metal. But nowadays, when you buy, might buy most of those, they are normally induction friendly. You see, you got a regular pan, has to have metal, iron. 
Yeah. Oh, Diana, oh. a really good tip that I use is if I want to see if my pan will work for induction, I just put a magnet on the bottom of my pan, and if it sticks. Yeah, then... yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's very, very um, easy. Okay, now we'll make a sauce. Okay, let me see, make a sauce. How are you going to make a sauce? Because I want to make a sauce. Now, for pan base, you can have, go to the store and buy vegetarian stir fry sauce available. Vegetarian stir fry sauce in most stores. So everything is vegetarian. And then I put some vegetarian stir fry sauce right here. It's going to be delicious. A lot of, the, a lot of people don't realize pan based vegetables ingredients can be very delicious. You have different color contrast, flavor contrast. When this is all nice and done, I will thicken this up with time with cornstarch. So everything I do today is vegetarian. And then I'll make a special sauce by thickening it with a tiny bit of cornstarch solution. And then when I serve, this is how amazing. Look, look at how beautiful this is. Very, very good. The, wing, the wonderful thing about this is it is, has texture contrast and it tastes good, and everything is done. And I will show you how easy it is to serve this and make it even more. Now I have this noodle here. I shut this off, and I show you how beautiful this is. I put this vegetable on the side. Look at that. So I don't want to cover all my noodle. So this is how beautiful this is. Look at that. Can you, can you imagine? This is so beautiful. And Chef, this, quick question: Is your pan, are your pans both nonstick? Yeah, this is nonstick, but you do not have to use nonstick anyway. This is so beautiful. Now, to make it even more wonderful, let me show you. To make it even more wonderful, I use in California. We're blessed with all these wonderful things: pistachio nut, total protein, just as meat and chicken. I eat this as a snack. I also use it. I literally make it interesting. I crush this pistachio nut right here, and I sprinkle it on top to enhance the texture contrast. And okay. then, this is beautiful. And then I make it even more. So this way, all of a sudden, you have a beautiful, delicious, plant-based, shredded vegetable over crispy noodle. And this dish, it is totally plant-based. Now, for more recipe, you know, in my cookbook, I always have a lot of vegetarian dishes, a lot of vegetable dishes. You can check out the this, okay, right here, yankingcook.com. For more recipe and cooking tips, this is the QR code that you can. And then this one of my cookbook, Martin Yen's Quick and Easy. This is my favorite book, Martin Yen's Feast. We won the cookbook award of the year in the World Book uh, uh, conference. But anyway, I want to show you in any kitchen, the most important thing is not only the frying pan, but the knife. And this is the knife that I use. I have designed. I want to show you how sharp this knife is. Okay. This is, you can tell how sharp this knife is. Look at, look at, okay. A sharp knife is a safe knife. This is how you test your knife. Sharp one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is how you test your knife is sharp or not. Look at that. Can you see that? Now, just in case you have never, never used a Chinese chef knife before, don't worry. I come up with this wonderful finger guard right here. And when you use the finger guard, let me show you how easy it is. You put your finger here inside. So when you cut, you protect your finger. Look at that. That's so smart. So, how this often is do you really, sharpen your knives? Uh, we don't have to sharpen the knife that much. Basically, what you normally do is let me show you quickly. When you sharpen your knife, all you have to use is use a steel. I happen to have a diamond sharpening steel here. See, this is diamond sharpening steel. It's flat, so I will show you how easy it is. Normally, it's round. Normally, the stick, the sharpening steel is round, and it's steel. It does not really sharpen your knife, it only hone your knife. But this is diamond, look at that. This is diamond. I actually sharpen my knife, one, two, three. I can literally sharpen my knife. This is diamond sharpening steel. Let me show you how sharp this is, okay? 
Now, I put a piece of paper right here, and when I slice it, you can see one and a two. This is how sharp this is. A sharp knife is a safe knife. If anybody interested, you can always check out our website, and I will autograph the cookbook, and I'm quite sure everybody. Today, I have basically show you this. Look at, look at this. This is why I'm asking you any question. Look at this. This is crispy noodle pancake with vegetarian and pistachio nut. Very full of protein, a lot of vegetable, a lot of nutrient, a lot of new, basically one dish meal filled with nutrient. Anybody have any question? Does anyone have a question for chef? I love all the texture and flavors that are in that dish. The pistachios were a really nice surprise. Not only flavorful. You think the great the thing is, you know, for just in case you, you want to have some questions, just all you have to do is send it to yankingcook.com and ask some questions and for cooking tips and more recipes, I'll be happy to answer for you. Thank you, Chef. Um, let's see. I'm just checking to see if there's any other question. I have a really quick question. Um, what what are your family holiday? Oh, pan recommendations. Someone's asking. Okay. Any pan recommendations? Pan, pan, pan recommendation. Mm -hmm. I use uh, the the, the um, I use the uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, things available. This is a circulon. You can use anulon, circulon, or any of the nonstick if you make making noodle pancake. But if you have a nice, well seasoned um, cast iron pan or cast iron, it's okay too. It doesn't matter. But this one it makes it easier. You can use a lot less oil. And that's the reason why I use good quality nonstick. And if you don't have a nonstick, you can use a well seasoned wok, a well seasoned um, skillet or frying pan. Anything we do, just make sure the high temperature shut down, it sears the meat, and then you end up having a dish look so beautiful. Look at that. This is the dish that you're good. Well, thank you so much, Chef. I need to run to my next session, but if, uh, and to answer Katrin's question, a wok will work with an induction burner. Uh, Definitely. If anyone, uh, and if I anyone mean, has any other questions, put it in the chat, please. I've been using induction burner for many, many years. I mean, my, all my presentation, I use induction burner. So it just saved the world, saved the uh, mother nature. It is environmental friendly. Take down all the um, uh, carbon um, uh, footprints. That's very good to use induction burner, induction cooktop. Thank you so much, Chef. Have a great You're rest welcome. of your day. Enjoy the rest of the session. Okay, I think we are ready to begin okay. with Chef Shruti Boda, who, of course, this is my favorite part of any meal, specializes <laughs> in desserts. So I have to ask the question that everybody is thinking of, do you get to eat cake every single day? <laughs> Um, I do have the opportunity to eat cake every single uh -huh. day. I can. <laughs> just, uh, just for my own like sanity. Uh, there was a point during the pandemic where I, when I was just like overloading on on my on cake, cake. <laughs> um, and then now I'm like, okay, it's it's time to you know do it in moderation. Like I I love cake, but in moderation. <laughs> So are you, I mean, are you craving like salty or sour at the end of the day because of what you do? Yeah, I think definitely. Like I'm like the classic person who's like, have something sweet, then have something salty, then I need something sweet again, then I need something salty. So there's like um, a lot going into my system by the end of the day. <laughs> Gotta balance it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about these super cute little desserts that you're making today. Masala Kai Kheer Jars. Yeah, totally. Um, so I actually wanted to create something that kind of brought out some nostalgic flavors from my childhood, just like the classic Indian sweet flavors. So we use a lot of cardamom, we use a lot of cloves, we use pistachio. Um, I really wanted to bring those elements in, but I also wanted to create something a little modern, a little aesthetic. Um, so what I'm creating today is like, I would say they kind of resemble trifle jars with like di different layers and we'll be making it in th these little uh, these little guys. And 
Are there can, a few you, can you tell people who are unfamiliar what Cure is? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so it has a few layers, and one of the layers is a Kheer layer. Um, so Kheer is actually a traditional Indian pudding. Um, so it's something that we used to make like literally all the time during festivals or any like special occasion. It's really easy to make, and I'll walk us through how to make it. Uh, it's um, traditionally made with milk um, and as well as uh, sago. So it's like sago is kind of like I would say they're similar to tapioca pearls. Mm -hmm. um, you get this at like your local Indian store. Um, I'm going to be using coconut milk uh, to make it vegan. Um, and then everything else is like pretty similar to um, the traditional recipe, which is like one or two tweaks. And we've worked through that. So it's a really delicious, like uh, easy Indian dessert. Um, you can eat it hot or cold. For the jars, we're going to have it cold. And I kind of pre prepped some uh, to layer it in. but. As soon as it's done, it's obviously going to be hot, and it's also a great way to eat it. Um, I think the cool thing about this dessert is there are a few layers and a few elements, um, and each of those can actually be like eaten as is. So, like if you look at the recipe after uh, today, and you're like, oh, this is just like too many things, uh, you can just pick one and make it and eat it as a dessert, and that would be totally fine. I just wanted to kind of add a little bit of a twist. If you were like hosting friends or doing a dinner party, this is like a cute. A uh, little thing to try. Everybody likes their own little jar like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So and can, so you, can you make this in advance too? Because, you know, during the holidays, we're all making a ton of dishes and we always want things that we can prep ahead of time. So, could you make this ahead of time? And if so, how far in advance? Absolutely. Um, I would say, like, each of the layers that we're going to walk through can be made a couple of days in advance for sure. And then mm -hmm. I would recommend assembling it on the day off just so things don't get like too messy in the jar. Uh -huh. uh, but each but each of like I I prepped everything like on Friday evening. So I think that would be totally fine for the holidays. So how do we start making yes. this? Yeah totally. So I'm actually gonna start start with making the kheer. Um, and while that goes on I can walk through some of the other layers. Um, so we're going to be using this induction cooktop, which okay. I love. I think as a vegan who is really passionate about the environment, it's great that we have these options. Um, and I'm very excited to use it. Um, so I'm going to start with boiling this coconut milk. Um, it's just two cups of coconut milk that I poured out. Um, and I'm going to put it here. And... I'm just going to put it on like maybe medium. Um, yeah, I feel like it boils pretty quick on the induction cooktop. So I'm going to put that on medium um, and let it boil. Um, and after that boils, we're going to add the sago that I just talked about. One thing with the sago is you probably want to soak it for about 30 minutes before using it just to kind of soften it up and make it easier to cook. Um, otherwise, it would just take much longer to cook and uh, we don't want that. So, and if people can find sago easily, could they use tapioca? Or would it be just to I do it? I haven't tried it with tapioca. I'm not sure. So these are really small. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm probably unaware if like tapioca balls would be as small as this. And if so, I think that would be totally fine. Um, these are just uh, much smaller than like the tapioca, tapioca balls I've seen, but I could also just be unfamiliar with what's out there. Um, but but it's but sago is really like it's really easy to get in your local Indian store. Like every Indian store has uh, sago for sure. So if, if that's something that's accessible to you, um, hopefully it would be easy to get. Or probably online, it's available too. Oh, yeah, absolutely for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So so while that boils, maybe I do medium high just just in case. Um, okay. So while that boils, um, and like I said, the key layer, layer is probably like one of the most important layers to what I'm making. But the second most important layer is actually this masala chai cookie, which I made beforehand. Um, I made it beforehand, but it's really easy to make. It took me 20 minutes end to end. Uh, very simple vegan ingredients, coconut oil, maple syrup. Um, I think the most important thing is the masala chai powder. Uh, and I think that's really easy to get even in your local grocery stores. Um, my only recommendation would be to kind of grind it into like a fine powder because sometimes you get it in with, with like pieces of whole spices and you don't want that going into your cookie. So I just use what I like and I uh, and I made it made sure it was a fine powder. Typically it's just black tea, um, cinnamon, cloves, cardamom, those are those are the main ingredients, pepper as well. 
Um, there are a few variations out there, but uh, everything smells really good and tastes really good. So I would just recommend um, you know grinding it up and using it in this cookie uh, that is really, really easy to bake. And that would be another layer that we are using. I see what you mean about all the layers being so wonderful just on their own, because I would just eat those cookies right then and there. <laughs> wow, absolutely. Like that's, that's literally what I did. I think I baked like half a dozen and I like definitely ate two yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you if you just wanted like uh, like Christmas cookies or whatever, oh, you yeah. cookies, um, mm -hmm. if you just wanted something like warm, like a warm pudding, you could just make the keys and it, it would be fine. Um, so yeah, those are the two main layers. And what I'm going to do is kind of lay, like do a couple of layers of each. And that would kind of make the, the base of the jar. Um, if people on, didn't have little glass jars like that, what would you suggest they use instead? Yeah, um, I would like, you could use like a regular, I, I don't have one here, but like even a regular drinking cup, I think would be oh, uh -huh. fine, uh, like a glass. Uh, a, a glass glass <laughs> would be totally fine. Um, I, I think the key is just that it's transparent, so you can see the layers and it looks pretty. Uh, but but I think any anything else would work out perfectly well. Yeah, it's like a wine glass or something. Or... Oh, that's actually a good idea. Oh my god, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would look really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so those are the two, two main layers. Um, what I what I like topping it with is. Um, this coconut with coconut cream also really easy to make um all you need is like a can of coconut milk and you refrigerate it overnight uh the next day the, the there's going to be a layer of cream that's formed on top and you just take that out of the can and whip it using a hand mixer a stand mixer um and you can add maple syrup um i added cardamom powder to it to kind of keep oh, in line nice. with the whole masala chai flavor um i actually use whipped coconut cream on all like almost all my cakes, like that's the main icing that I use. And people seem to really like it because it's not like overwhelmingly sweet. Um, and it's like, I personally think it's better than like regular whipped cream. It gives like a really nice creamy uh, texture. Uh, Does it hold hold its um, structure pretty well? It doesn't start to weep or anything after a day or two? That's a really good question. As long as it's kept in room temperature, it's fine. Uh, it is definitely a little, sensitive like if i if i keep it in like direct sunlight it's probably not going to do well uh, but as long as it's kept at room temperature so far it's been pretty pretty good and as long as you use like a good mixer to whip it up it it holds pretty well um and i just like i'm obsessed with it like i can eat like a whole jar of it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so i have one question from linda who wants to know where you can buy masala kai powder and do you have a particular brand that you like yeah, um, so you can definitely get it from most stores. Like even um, like Tazo, the tea brand has uh, has masala chai tea bags, and you could just like use the powder from those bags. I um, recently started using this brand called it's called Kolkata Chai Co. Um, I don't I think they're based out of New York, but um, but I really like them, and I got them to ship some uh, for me. Um, but like I would say there are so many chai brands out there um, in, in the recipe that's going to go out. I did link a couple if people are interested in using those, but if oh, not, like, uh -huh. yeah, but if not Tazo, like I usually get Tazo in like Whole Foods or wherever, and uh, that's a great option as well. Yeah. So do you want to show people how to put this together then? I will start assembling. I'll, make, I'll start with the first two layers and then we can get back to the cave to see okay. how that's doing. Uh, but this is the key that I pre-prepped um, and just a note that like this is probably a step that you would want to pre-prep because um, as soon as you make it it's like pretty liquidy um, it's not really like friendly to layer in a trifle oh, jar. Oh, I don't get everything too soggy, yeah. Exactly, exactly. so if you refrigerate this overnight it thickens significant, significantly um, and that's the consistency that you want for, uh, for this jar. Um, cool, so let's make sure that this can be seen okay all right hopefully that's cleared and i will i will bring it closer as well in a second so i just start off with the first layer of kheer um so my kheer like i used coconut sugar for this one you can use regular sugar uh but that's why it's like a little brown um if you use regular sugar you probably wouldn't so you get use, like brown sugar or 
yeah, you could, are white granulated. Yeah, you could use any sugar that you or honey even maybe. Yeah, I've tried it with maple syrup as mm -hmm. well. Um, it's it's it de it's definitely good. It works out pretty well because it it doesn't change the consistency or anything. So you could definitely use um use that as well. So, in case people aren't familiar with your Shrews Kitchen, yeah. um, this is wonderful vegan cake bakery mm -hmm. run out of your house. Yes. And how challenging is it to do a business out of your home like that? <laughs> um, I, think, I think some parts are challenging because I'm, I think I'm small enough now that I end up having to do everything by myself. Um, Is that like, good or bad? <laughs> like from like cleaning and oh. uh, just like the, I'm mean, reaching out to people, uh, responding to things, Instagram. So I think it's, it can be hard to kind of context switch sometimes. Um, but aside from that, like I think there is some level of convenience running it out of your home. Uh, just you know, it's uh, it's a space you're familiar with. Um, so those are like the conveniences. The inconveniences are like I have one oven. <laughs> I wish I had like five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did a layer of tea, and now I'm, I'm doing a layer of the cookies. So I'm I'm just like crumbling up the cookies in no particular way, um, and doing a layer of those. So you could assemble this, say, the morning of Thanksgiving and leave it in the fridge till you serve your dinner that yeah, night? Yeah, I think that would be totally fine, yeah. Yeah, you could, oops. Yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, so I did a layer of the cookie and now I'm doing a layer of the kid. Um, I promise I don't make it this messy when I'm not on camera. But <laughs> So what are the most popular flavors of cake that you do? Yeah, um, I think the most popular one, um, so I, I really like incorporating like um, elements of like my childhood and like Indian sweets. And so I created a flavor literally called Flavors of India, not a very creative name, but, uh, but it has like, it's a cardamom pistachio cake. Um, and it has like a rose coconut cream icing and like oh, rose, nice. rose petals on top. Yeah, and I like genuinely like it. Um, and it's definitely one of the most popular flavors. Like I think people think it's pretty unique. Um, so that's been, it's been really nice like hearing feedback about that particular flavor. So do you find that most of your customers are vegan or do you also have a lot of customers who are um, regular carnivores and they just want to try something different and healthy yeah that's a good question um i feel like a lot of people reach out if they are either vegan or like um dairy intolerant oh. um, but they do get it for like larger celebrations that tend to have non-vegans in it and um most of the time i have got really positive feedback saying like oh even the non-vegans uh, really enjoyed your cake and like wanted more of it. So I think that's been nice to hear. That's the ultimate compliment. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like getting vegan desserts is like hard. Like even though the Bay is probably one of the most like nice vegan friendly places uh -huh. to be, like it's still not as easy as you think. So it's definitely uh, nice to hear that. I think people are under the mistaken impression that um, if you're having a vegan baker, that it's not going to be as decadent tasting or satisfying. Yes, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I definitely think people think that. I, and I understand where that comes from. But um, I think that's why all, all of us vegan bakers and chefs are here to hopefully change that perception. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So I did a couple of layers um, and we're pretty much at the top of the jar. So I'm going to kind of top it off. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the heat. Once this gets to a boil, uh, all you need to do is add all your sago mm -hmm. uh, that's been soaked. Um, and that, and like basically it needs to be at a boil so that the sago um, cooks through completely. So once you put that in, the other ingredient to put in um, is saffron. Um, I love this, like it's, uh, it's such a nice spice. We use it in a lot of Indian desserts. Um, it smells like so aromatic. It gives like this slight, slightly sweet taste. And I think depending on how much you put in, it also gives like a nice tinge of color. So I'm going to put in like four or five strands of saffron. 
just to give a it a little that. goes a long way. Yes, yes, a little goes a long way for sure. Um, and then kind of mix it up. Um, and honestly, like this would be pretty much done. Um, uh -huh. Then once it starts um, cooking a little more, you could add the sugar in at any point. Um, and like I said, you could do uh, regular sugar, you could do like brown sugar, coconut sugar, um, whatever works. Um, and so you put that in, mix it up. Um, if you wanted to eat this as is without making the jar, you could just add like some cardamom powder, you could add uh, pistachios, cashew nuts, almonds, just to give it a little bit of a crunch and the pudding would be like the, the traditional one that we would eat in India during like festivals and that would, uh, you know, that would just be it. So, um, so what kind of texture are you looking for with the sago? Should it be thoroughly soft or should it be a little chewy or al dente or? Yeah, uh, I would say it should be like very close to thoroughly soft. Um, oh, so okay. Yeah, we don't want it to be like too soft where it like starts getting mushy and like break like breaking apart or like smashing apart. Uh, but like very close to soft because uh, to give like a more comforting feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that um, just baking in general, um, you have to be so precise and you have to pay so much attention to detail as opposed to savory cooking where, you know, you can throw in a little this, little that, and just kind of do whatever comes to mind. So when you decided to bake entirely vegan, was it a difficult process to figure out how to get things just right using only vegan ingredients? Yeah, uh, I would say definitely. And like, it's exactly what you said. I think it's spot on where like, I think baking is more of a science and like cooking can be more artistic. And like, I would say like, even though I bake most of the time, when I cook, that's kind of more of my like stress-free uh, time because you can be like really creative and you don't uh -huh. have, it's, it's not precise. But with baking, like, even if you get one thing wrong, like <laughs> your cake is going to be in the oven. Uh, so it definitely took me a while to like understand vegan baking. Like I had to do a lot of research on substitutes uh, that could be used. Um, and But then I feel like once you like get a hang of a few things, um, it's, it's kind of uphill from there. Uh, but the initial days of like figuring it out was really hard. And I was like, oh my God, this tastes awful. Like why would I even want to eat like a vegan cake? Uh, but then now I like absolutely don't feel that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So, so what do you find to use for like egg substitutes? Yeah, um, I think applesauce is a really good one. Oh. Um, yeah, I really like using that. Or like sometimes even just like depending on what I'm making, um, like a like a vegan so like a vegan butter, buttermilk, so like almond milk with um with vinegar or apple cider vinegar. Um, flax seeds is a good one uh, for like more bread. Like if I'm making banana bread, I like using flax seed butter. Um, so yeah, I feel like there are a few just depending on what you're making. Um, but yeah, there's definitely no no dearth of substitutes now. Like I like now in hindsight, I'm like, oh, why did I like ever think that you can't bake without eggs or butter or whatever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So I. It looks like I didn't figure this out, which is fine, but hopefully you got the, the gist of this one. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're almost done with like assembling the jars. Um, I'll just show you like the final bits. Um, so this is the coconut cream that I talked about that I can literally like, if I was not on camera, this whole thing would <laughs> <be done. laughs> uh, But yeah, if you can just kind of top it and press it down a little bit. Um, and like I mentioned, this is um, flavored with cardamom powder. Um, and it just gives like, it just adds on to the masala chai flavors that we have in the cookies. Um, so you can kind of just fill that to the top. And that's so if it. somebody wanted to add maybe some fruit to this, what would you recommend? Hmm. Um, I think depend. it would depend on the fruit, like maybe something like pomegranate. Oh, um, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah, I think that might be nice. Maybe like apple, 
could work. Um, I don't know about mango. That might be, but that that could yeah. I feel like you could definitely like try it out. Like I think it would. I think like the first thing that comes to head is pomegranate. I think that would taste really nice. Perfect for this time of year too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it would add like a nice pop of color because I feel like otherwise this is pretty like uh, not as colorful. So maybe pomegranate would add a little bit of color. Um, so yeah, that's the coconut cream layer. Um, on top, I actually. Uh, add chopped pistachios. Um, so again, like a lot of Indian sweets use uh, pistachios and it just get, like gives like a really nice crunch. Um, and also I feel like enha it enhances the other flavors. Um, the other thing that I add, um, which like is interesting, I think, um, is candied ginger. Um, oh, so I love that. Yeah, See, I love you can eat whipped coconut cream, I could eat candy <laughs> ginger by the handful, just play. <laughs> I know, it's so good. I'm like, um, so traditional Indian chai is like made, um, like a lot of people grate fresh ginger and, uh, and boil the chai with it. Uh, so I just thought it was like, oh, what's a good way to like add some of that ginger? And then I like found this candy ginger and I was like, okay, this is what we need. Like it gives like a nice kick um, to, the, to the whole thing. And yeah, it's like you said, it's so good. Like I can just, I can totally snack on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's. So for people who um, don't do a lot of vegan baking, yeah. do you have any advice for them? I mean, is it is it easy or is it extremely difficult to just take a regular cake recipe that you see out of a magazine or cookbook and try to make it vegan yeah um i like i don't think it's hard like i think it's um it's it can be scary and I, like i'm speaking out of experience where like i was scared i was like oh i'm just gonna do this completely wrong but i think it's just about like taking that plunge and doing a little bit of research like i wouldn't deny that like um, vegan baking does need a little bit of research, um, but once you do that initial research, I think that like I think it's really easy uh, once you figure out like a couple of basic things. Um, and I would not be intimidated or scared by it. Like that's my advice to anyone. Just like if that's what you want to do, go for it. Like once you, it's just like regular baking. Um, like when you first tried regular baking, like I'm sure anyone would be like a little scared like oh what am i doing because like it's a little bit of a sense so it's technical at times yeah a bit technical uh, but then once you you know get those first two cakes right then you're good <laughs> well i want to thank you for being here and for all of you out there in the audience thank you for joining us happy holidays to all of you and i hope it is an extra sweet one because you make this dessert to serve to everyone too so thank you Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone. My name is Liren Baker. I'm originally from New York, but I've been in California since 2000. And in 2010, I started my site, Kitchen Confidant, and I've been doing it ever since. It's developed into a full-time career. And I had just published Me to the Side. It'll be available November 30th. So, yes. Yay, thank you. <laughs> So I am so pleased to introduce Chef Alicia Casas, a native of the East Bay. Chef Alicia has roots from San Luis Potosi and Zacatecas, Mexico, and has been an educator in the San Jose area for 14 years. She is also the owner and head baker of Jaguar Baker, an all-vegan bakery based in the South Bay that opened in 2017. And although they temporarily closed this year, they are looking forward to returning to the South Bay in the near future. So chef, quick question for already from everybody. What are you going to be making for us today? Yeah, today uh, I'm going to make our filled churro cupcakes and they are our most popular cupcake at our bakery. And we'll have uh, two fillings, one with the caramel filling and uh, the other filling will be with um, coconut whipped cream. And of course it's all plant based. Oh, that sounds so good. Which one's your favorite? I have to ask. Ooh, that's a hard one. I really love, they're both really good. I think I go towards the coconut whipped cream filled because I just really love coconut whipped cream. It's so soft and light and airy and all that, all that good stuff. And does the coconut whipped cream 
is it sturdy inside the cupcake or or is it the kind of thing that you have to eat right away it it actually is so it, coconut whipped cream has i have like a love hate relationship with it making it because it can be a little too thin to hold its shape uh but if you make it if you just have everything at just the right temperature and the right timing it holds up really nicely it can be um, nice and stiff so actually the one that i pre-made is a little bit on the thinner side but it's holding well in the cupcake again my name's alicia and i'm super excited to be making some uh, filled churro cupcakes for you today to demo those um, so i hope you enjoy and do we get started or should we? Yeah, before you begin, I just was curious, what led you to your journey in, ve in just vegan cooking and the vegan lifestyle? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I became vegan in 2011 and I was vegetarian since I was 17. 2011, when I finished my master's degree, I became vegan because I was looking for a way to have a really good cleanse after eating so much junk food during the program and all of that. So uh, I read in a Chinese medicine book that the best way to cleanse your system is to eat, uh, eliminate all animal products. And so I tried that and it, I loved the way I felt and I just, just physically and emotionally and I just stuck with it. So, and I was really happy that I'm all, I was also contributing, contributing in a, in a way that was bigger than just myself. So. Um, and the hardest thing to give up were sweets for me. And back at that time, baked goods weren't that much available. They weren't that available. So I started looking for um, bakers that were vegan and I found a few and I just started making my own at home and sharing with my coworkers. And they were, they were enjoying them. So I thought, okay, I can maybe do this, share with more people. Wow. And um, I imagine that over that span of time, just the access to vegan products and all of that has improved and gotten so much easier. Absolutely, yes. Uh, coming across the, the ingredients and new products becoming available, like the coconut whipped cream in a, in a can instead of doing the longer process, which is taking the normal co canned uh, coconut milk and other things like aquafaba that was has just come in the past i don't know two or three years that wasn't available when i first started so um it's it's exciting exciting times well i'll let you get started i'll probably ask you some questions along the way but just make sure that we just want to make sure that we have enough time to make your dish so yes absolutely okay so thank you and welcome everyone to my um, humble kitchen so i will go ahead and get started making our filled churro cupcakes. Uh, the first thing that you should always do as a baker, and you probably already know that this is making sure that your oven is on, right? That preheating is super important to make your uh, treats, to make them come out the way they should. So I have my bowls here. I have all my ingredients prepped and that is also makes baking a lot easier. So everything is already measured out here. I know you can't really see it, but I will show you as I go along. So in this bowl, this will be my main mixing bowl, is my uh, all-purpose flour and whole wheat pastry flour. So I use one and a fourth cup for the all-purpose flour and one fourth cup of whole wheat pastry flour. And so I combine both of them. Um, it's, a, it's very little whole wheat pastry flour, uh, but it just, I really find that I like the flavor better, even though it's extremely subtle, but the whole wheat uh, flour gives it, I don't know, make something like a smoother taste. So I, in all my recipes, I actually incorporate some of the whole wheat pastry flour. So that's already been sifted. So it's super important to sift when you bake because that makes sure that you have less lumps in your batter, right? So I'm going to sift my the rest of my uh, dry ingredients. So I have uh, baking soda, one teaspoon of baking soda and that goes right in through the sifter. I have, uh, since they are churros, cinnamon, super important, two teaspoons of cinnamon here, also through the sifter, and a half a teaspoon of salt in uh, also going through the sifter. And that might not sift through as well, but you can just flip it over and it'll go right through. 
And please let me know if you have any questions about any of these ingredients. There is a question on why the pastry flour? Can we substitute that with, let's say, an all-purpose or another kind? Yes, definitely. So most recipes are all-purpose flour just completely. Uh, I just, I have very weird taste buds. I can actually taste flour in some baked goods. And so using the, the whole wheat flour kind of minimizes that. Um, and that's my main reason for using the, the pastry flour. So you do not have to use that. So if you don't have uh, the whole wheat flour, you can even use just plain whole wheat flour. Um, and it'll, when you sift it, it'll take those, those large flakes out. And so you won't use those. Um, but you can use just completely all purpose flour. And if you're gluten free, these bake really well in gluten free. So you would just use one and a half cups of your favorite gluten free flour. Uh, I'm partial to the Bob's Red Mill uh, one to one gluten free flour. I feel that it works really well. And you don't have to add that uh, guar gum or xanthan gum, sorry, xanthan gum. And it just works super well. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and just give it a little whisk here and go to my wet ingredients. So my wet ingredients are um, one half a cup of your favorite non-dairy milk. Um, I am partial to using almond milk. This is oat milk. And I also really enjoy using um, soy milk just because of the thicker consistency and it has a little more protein. But I know a lot of folks don't consume soy, so oat milk is a really great alternative for the nut allergies and uh, for soy allergies as well. And I also use, so here it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but this is actually uh, mineral water. You can also use soda water. And it's just a one fourth, one fourth cup of this uh, mineral water. And I use that because of the bubbles that it has. So um, I try, I just poured it a little while ago. I was trying to make sure that I didn't eliminate those bubbles, those gas bubbles, but that actually increases the texture of the, of the tree. So I added that in there. Next is our apple cider vinegar, which is one of the things that causes the chemical reactions um, that will act like an egg. So the apple cider vinegar, when you pour it into the milk, it, it does kind of a little, um, I don't know, curdling action, not a lot, but just, just very slightly. And it will react with the baking soda in the, in the dry ingredients, and that gives it that, that fluffy texture. So I know a lot of folks are surprised when they try um, not just our vegan baked goods, but others, and they were like, wow, the texture is so great. Well, it's the apple cider vinegar there with the baking soda. Okay, so I have those there. I have my sugars here, and a lot of people don't, well, they are not wet ingredients, right? But I always add these in with our wet ingredients uh, because the, the wet ingredients will, will dissolve the granules. So the, the type of sugar that we use are, um, are not the typical white sugar, which is very thin, those granules. Uh, that white sugar, uh, the normal white sugar has uh, bone chard, which is why we don't use it. So we use organic cane sugar and that, that those granules are pretty, pretty big. So if you just put them in the dry ingredients, they'll show up in the actual bread itself. So I always put it in with the, right after I do the milk, throw in the milk, and then uh, since this is a churro cupcake, I added brown sugar to give that, that warm flavor, to add to the flavor and the color as well. Okay, so I give that a mix. And especially with the brown sugar, it tends to have, get those little clumps. Uh, so you wanna make sure that those, that, that's nice and mixed. And then I have my one tablespoon of um, vanilla extract going right in there as well. Okay, so I'm mixing all those. I make sure that those are well incorporated before I add my oil or my fat. So this is one half cup of canola oil. I know that uh, some people prefer healthier oil, so you can substitute with like coconut oil 
Um, you can also substitute with, with butter. If you want to melt the plant-based butter, you can use that in here. I just find that it makes the cake, uh, it, it won't rise as much. So uh, canola oil is really good is really good for baking. So, so we have, we have some, some questions. questions. Um, uh, Julia would like to know what the quantity of apple cider vinegar is and sugar. And sugar? Mm -hmm. Yes. So apple cider vinegar, it's two tablespoons, two full tablespoons. And sugar is, for this recipe, it's one cup of sugar and two of uh, cane sugar and two tablespoons of, of brown sugar. And so the any our, just our baseline cake recipes usually call for one cup of sugar just in general. And this one has added sugar because, again, because of the flavoring mostly and the color. Mm -hmm. And then is the amount of sugar the same if you use classic sugar instead of the larger cane sugar? Yes, I see that I'm echoing. Oh, um, I'm sorry, is the amount of sugar the same? It, yes, it is. It's still the same. Mm -hmm. And then Joanna, I apologize for the echo. Uh, Joanna basically had a question about the chemistry of non-dairy milks and vinegar, so you can still make buttermilk by mixing any non-dairy milk with vinegar or lemon. And that's, yeah. Yes, lemon as well. Yes, lemon is a really good, um, another really, so if you ran, if you run out of or you don't have apple cider vinegar, you can replace that with lemon or even just plain vinegar will work as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so now I, I have both of my dry and my wet mostly combined. And so now I'm just going to pour my wet into my dry ingredients all while mixing. You can also use a hand mixer uh, that will be more time efficient as well. And it, it helps with the with the lumps also. And so just in general with cake batters, you want to just make, mix until it's combined so that you don't lose that fluff, that texture. The longer you mix it, the it has a chance of not rising as much. So so I just kind of make sure that as I'm mixing to avoid those those lumps, I'm kind of picking up the from the from the middle to the sides and just not in large quantities, again, to avoid those lumps. If you have a few little lumps in your batter, that's totally fine. Uh, but the less lumps, obviously, the better. It, it won't, if you're like me and, and have those taste buds, you'll taste the flour. <laughs> so just mixing it well enough so that there are no more lumps. Okay. So once I have all of that mixed in, and some some bakers like to leave their their batter to sit to kind of incorporate and combine for a little while I'm up to 30 minutes you can definitely do that but you don't have to the texture everything will still come out nice if you just throw it right into the oven okay so there is our batter okay our churro batter it looks nice and it smells lovely already i'm gonna set this aside can you prepare the batter ahead of time and refrigerate it? You can, yes. I wouldn't, you can do it overnight. I think that would be fine. I, I, I've done that a few times, have the batter set overnight and it works, it, it rises just as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yes. If you want to be efficient, time efficient, another thing you can do is just have all of your dry ingredients prepared in one container, all your wet ingredients prepared in another container, and then just, oops, the day of, you just combine everything and kind of get that in. Uh, because we live in the Bay Area, you know, and time is money, so sometimes we're short on time, right? Uh, so all these little tricks that you learn as you, as you bake, as you practice, right? So um, I accidentally got a little better. So now I have my, uh, my baking cups and I'm putting that into my my baking pan and this recipe is enough for 12 cupcakes you can to pour your batter into the cupcake tin you can use a an ice cream scoop works very well that's probably the most efficient I for some reason like to make things more difficult <laughs> and so I use a, a, a measuring cup 
And this is a one third cup. That's actually this measurement is enough for each of the of the cupcakes. So, we have a question from Julia. Is there a noticeable difference if we use non-bubbly water? Uh, not, not a lot. No. So it'll you'll still have a moist you'll still have a moist cake, mm -hmm. and a, and a fluffy cake. You still will. Yeah. And to, and then Alicia has a question about where do we find the recipe? I believe we're going to be sharing the recipes after. Yes. You should get an email probably tomorrow, Alicia, with all the recipes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I'm not yet. Yeah, I'm not sure when you will get it, but you will definitely get this recipe. And if you make it and tag us, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, that would be awesome. I would love to see how yeah. out in the in the world. <laughs> oh, awesome. Next week, everyone, you'll get all the recipes. Yay. Absolutely. Yes. And again, uh, you can make these in gluten free and they come out super well. I, I always, I have a love hate relationship with gluten free as well, <laughs> because it's more difficult. It, it is uh, texture wise, it's a little more difficult to get the results that you want. But um, there are definitely folks out there who want and need gluten free and vegan. And as you know, that is difficult to find uh, and gluten free in pastries specifically. I know that you're really conscientious about sourcing your ingredients. So do you have any recommendations for your favorite ingredients for this recipe for or for vegan baking in general? Yeah, let's see. Ingredients wise, for we always do organic. So any organics um, for this recipe, the flowers that we use come from King Arthur. So we'll use their organic flowers. Let me see what else. Um, as far as like the, the frostings and the fillings, I use earth. I really enjoy earth balance. Uh, I know a lot of people stay away from earth balance because it has uh, palm oil in it. And so that's something that I did a little a bit of research because I didn't want to contribute to that, um, to the palm oil destruction in the, of the world. So I found that it's, they use sustainable palm oil and there's a, I don't remember the name of the organization right now, but they have a list of companies that use, um, that will use sustainable palm oil. And then we have another question about how do we get cupcakes to have the nice dome top and how much do you fill them up in tin? I know you said one third cup, but yes. I guess you have other tips too. Absolutely. That's a really great question. So in general, when you fill cupcakes, it should be about one third to three fourths of the way full. Uh, I think three fourths would be a little too much. It might you might overflow, but that nice dome would be uh, one third. I'm sorry, two thirds of the way uh, filled with your in your cupcake. Um, let me see. What other tips do I have for cupcakes? Sometimes there are cool spots in your oven. So if you know that, or maybe spots that are too hot, you want to be careful with that as well. So I would put these um, in the, uh, just in the spot that is, I don't know, has the best temperature, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, some treats are a little bit more temperamental with that, but I would say cupcakes in general, they, as long as you have them in the right, place they'll the the dome will be pretty good uh, let me see and for these specific ones so they they have a, a a top the the churro part of it is um they have that little sugar top on the dome and so to do that um you have to place these in the oven for three minutes let them bake for three minutes they'll get a little bit of that firm dome and then we go through and I have a little sugar and cinnamon and sugar mixture here. And we kind of do a little circle action to, to put that, make that top on these cupcakes. And so I'll show you what that is like in a moment. So let me throw these in. Three minutes. So since this recipe has no egg or egg replacer, Joanna's asking, what is the emulsifier? Uh, so the so it's the baking soda and apple cider um, apple cider vinegar together. Yes. 
And then would you recommend definitely using sparkling water when using gluten-free flour to get a better texture? I, I definitely would, yes. Anything to help with the gluten-free. Um, sparkling water is, I prefer that to soda water because soda water has the salt in it, right? And so I just, to eliminate any unnecessary ingredients, um, mineral water would be would be the best. Yeah, sparkling water. Karen is asking, would you ever bake these in convection mode? Um, I don't think I would. I would just go with the regular regular temperature, yeah. Okay. Um, and then do you normally use that emulsifier, the one that you just mentioned, instead of, let's say, Bob's Mills, Bob Mills egg replacement or just egg? Yeah, I would never use just egg in my baking because to me that's for... I've never seen any recipes with it actually, so I don't even know if it works, but to me just egg is for, to get an actual egg, right? To consume an egg. Uh, there, so in cakes, that the best for me is the apple cider vinegar with baking soda. I wouldn't use a flax, in some of our treats we use flax eggs, a flax egg, which is one tablespoon of flax seed and three tablespoons of water, and that gives it that, um, that eggy, texture we use that in our in our pan dulce um and in i have actually haven't tried it in our cakes but i know that with the the bread that we bake it's a little bit heavier so for cakes i want that really light texture Great. and as far as the egg replacers i just try to go as natural as possible you know closest to the actual ingredient closest to the plant. And so I would rather not use any of the processed, although you can, you can definitely use those. Yeah, Katie is saying that she uses just egg in her baking, all of her baking and thinks it works great. So, oh, excellent, good yeah. to know. Yeah, that is very good to know. So I heard my timer and okay. when you, so I'm going to pull out uh, my, my cupcakes, um, pulling it out with the, of course, with my oven mitt. <laughs> and so this is the part where you want to be careful. Um, if you feel uncomfortable, you can pull out the entire cupcake tin and put it on top of the oven. But I just kind of like to pull it out and do my little sprinkle action and then just push it right back in. That is going to re release some heat from the oven, but you can just leave it in for just a couple minutes longer. Okay, so. I have my timer here, and excuse my weird positioning here. I hope you can all see me. Uh, right now, I can see that my cupcakes have that little that little dome, so that's a really good uh, texture to be, so that it holds the the crunch of the of the sugar. And so I do a little circle. I go in a circle because the middle of the cupcake is going to be taken out for our fillings. So I just kind of try to keep as much of the, the actual sugar on the cake as possible. That is a good trick. <laughs> yeah. So I actually tried this with before, putting the sugar on before I put the cupcakes in the oven, and it just dissolves. It dissolves right into the, into the batter. So this will make sure that you have that little crunch going on. Okay. All right. So Steph, I have to run to the, my next closing, but there's one more question here that I'll, I'll tee up to you before I run off. There's a question about, is there a difference between baking on the top versus bottom rack in the oven? Oh, that's a great question. And so great. see you later. <laughs> Bye, Larry. Bye. Thank you. You can definitely bake on any of the racks, especially if you're making like a large quantity. You can, you definitely would want to use all of the levels in your oven for sure. Uh, but sometimes there are some really temperamental treats. So an example is we make a, a pan dulce called mantecada and that, that specific pan dulce, it will not rise unless it's like right in the middle of the oven. And that actually takes a really long time to make because it's whipped, it's aquafaba whipped. So um, if you, that's not in general, right? So if you're making cakes, that, that's not necessarily going to happen. But if you have a, 
a treat that is very specific, um, a pan dulce, for example, then you would have to be careful as far as the oven. And if there's not always a way to know that, a lot of times it's trial and error. So you have to be ready to remake something. And it can be a little frustrating, but that's how you learn all the tricks of the trade. So those are really great questions. Let me see. So I know I'm out of time here. I was going to show, I have my induction oven here and I was going to show you all how to make the frosting, the, uh, the filchuro frosting. And so let me show you here. I have my churro cupcakes made. And so you will also get, you'll get this, the frosting recipe with the cupcake uh, recipe. So here, as you can see, I filled uh, only six of the cupcakes. This is our caramel frosting. Uh, I didn't fill these, but I won't have time to show you. Um, you would go through and core, this is an apple corer, and you would core the cupcakes about uh, three, one, two thirds of the way down, uh, mostly, so you have that little hole there. And then you will take your frosting, your pastry bag. So here's my frosting here. Um, I just had it in my fridge and you pipe it down through. So you kind of go down a little bit and you push it through there and it'll give you that little churro top. I also have here our filled churro cupcakes, but this is with a, the coconut whipped cream. And so again, this, this coconut whipped cream came out a little bit thinner, but if you have the right temperature and everything, then you can definitely, um, It'll, it'll be sturdier, okay? So, I don't know, let me see if there are any other questions. Hi everyone, oh, it's so nice to see so many friends on here. Let's see, is there really sustainable palm oil? Yes, so um, that's a really great question. It's definitely an area that I've been doing more research and I've had the conversation about using like Miyoko's. I know that there are a lot of um, plant-based butters that don't use palm oil. Uh, the problem that I've found with those is that they contain nuts. And so there are a lot of nut allergies, which is why we don't use the, the Miyoko's. And, but that would definitely be a really great um, substitute. I also really enjoy the texture of, of Earth Balance. So um, that's another thing. So yeah, definitely, I would definitely have to do more research on the sustainability of the palm oil that that is tagged that way All right so thank you for bringing that up yeah oh yes so so with the apple corer um as you can see here i know i'm going over my time everyone so so you can see the little piece of cake there i have my little jar that has the the rest of the bits what you can do with these little bits is you can make your own cake jar so I have plenty of coconut whipped cream in my fridge that I can use to and have some fruit with these, maybe cook up some apples or something and, and make a little cake jar. That would be, that is super tasty. I've done that before with these um, little bits. Or you can make your own uh, cake pops as well. So definitely reuse these little bits that you have from the cupcakes. So thanks for bringing that up. So thank you so much for joining me in my kitchen and following along with my filled churro cupcakes. I hope you get to make them. And if you do, please make sure you tag us. And I would love to see how they live out there. Baking brings me a lot of joy and I hope you can share it with your family and friends. Baking together, uh, it's just really nice times. And of course, you get to enjoy those delicious treats at the end. What's that's even better. So uh, hope, hope, hoping that you all have a great Sunday and that you have a great week as well. And I will see you later. Hi, Laren. How's it Hi. going? Good. How good. Are you? Good. Great. Just waiting for Carolyn, and then we'll go ahead and get started. It went fast. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you for joining us. It went by fast. I heard you say yeah. that. That's really great. <laughs>
I, I definitely, though, had so much fun watching these cooking demonstrations. And I feel personally as if I learned so many techniques when it comes to just, you know, using plant based ingredients. And um, I'm looking forward to applying these techniques in my own uh, cooking here, here in my kitchen. Uh, for those of you that are watching, joining me are the two event moderators from this evening, Laren Baker and Carolyn Jung. Uh, Laren, let's start with you. Are there a couple things you would like to highlight from the cooking demonstrations that you were a part of? Well, I just came from Chef Alicia Casas baking. She made some churro filled cupcakes and it was really interesting because I know that baking can be challenging if you're um, mm -hmm. plant based or vegan, I should say. And for me, what was really interesting was uh, that she didn't use any egg replacers. So she likes using a combination of mineral water, baking soda, and apple cider vinegar. Um, and that really helps to emulsify the batter. And then the other interesting thing too, was that she likes using a whole wheat pastry flour. She actually mm. has really hyper attuned taste buds and can usually taste like the taste of flour. And so for her, um, that provides just a smoother, like, uh, I guess, texture. So I thought that was really fascinating. Absolutely. Um, that emulsifying technique, I'm going to have to try that out myself because I, I struggle when it comes to plant-based baking. It's just a whole other world. And Carolyn, how about you? Well, I think what I especially enjoyed about the um, two recipes that um, Chef Kenny and Chef Shruti did were that um, I think a lot of times, especially with chef type recipes, people get very intimidated because there are all these steps and they think, oh my God, that's just too much trouble. I can't deal with this. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it and as they mentioned too, you can just make part of the recipe and it'll be fine just as is, um, for instance, with the risotto stuffed into a pumpkin, you could just make mm -hmm. the risotto and put it on a nice platter to serve or with Chef Shruti's, um cure sort of layered parfait you know she mentioned you could just make the cure and have it um, either hot or cold as this wonderful creamy coconut based pudding or just make the masala kai cookies and frankly just eat those by themselves <laughs> because they're just so darn good so I, I like the idea that both of those give you options in case you're feeling overwhelmed by the, hol by the holidays already Absolutely. Yeah. There's some flexibility there. Right. Yeah. And uh, one thing I, I really um, liked and appreciated from Yan's cooking demonstration is the fact that his recipe can incorporate noodles that have already been cooked. Maybe they're a couple of days old. I know in my own cooking, I, I make, you know, large portions and then eat it throughout the week. And sometimes I have some leftovers. So it will be great to try his recipe and incorporate some of my leftover noodles. I agree. I also liked how he was able to just use little scraps that are left in his vegetable bin, like just little yep. knobs of carrots, little knobs of cabbage. And, you know, it all comes together and it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a whole carrot, right? <laughs> whatever you have lurking in your bin. Right. If right. only we could all chop like him, though. <laughs> <laughs> he has mad He's skills. Master that of I the craft. So jealous of. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Carolyn, Laren, thank you both so much for your participation this evening. It was great seeing both of you and uh, hopefully we can see you at the next one.